with the screen open to the PowerPoint presentation that you will see as our speakers share their wisdom. All participants are muted, but you can send questions via the chat and or the QA button. And our presenters will try their best as they're presenting to address these questions during their discussion. In addition, we'll be sending out a recording of this presentation afterwards and hope to answer anything we did not get to in that email. Before introducing our esteemed presenters, I'd like to briefly tell you about Migdal Or. Migdal Or means Tower of Light in Hebrew. Our organization does just that. It serves as a beacon of hope to thousands of orphaned and neglected children. We serve over 10,000 children annually, and we raise them to become thriving, successful adults giving these children the support and education that they need to overcome economic, socioeconomic barriers and realize their full potential, contributing to the country of Israel as active and engaged citizens of the state of Israel. We were established in 1972 by an Israel Prize laureate named Rabbi David Yitzhak David Grossman, to, who believed that he wanted to ensure that Israel's orphaned, abused, and neglected children would have a bright future, regardless of where they came from. Decades later, we're still committed to doing, doing just that, and we're strengthening Israel's next generation from the ground up. Today, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we've mobilized to respond to critical needs due to the crisis in Israel and around the world. Our focus is in Israel, helping children, families, elderly, with basic essentials, partnering with the government and the IDF to provide urgently needed relief, distributing food packages right now before Passover, to over 25,000 families in need. If you wanna learn more, you'll see in your chat, you can click on passover.migdalorusa.org. Any help is greatly appreciated and would make a huge impact on the lives of these individuals. We find ourselves in uncertain times these days and it's challenging each of us in very big and small ways. My job is to connect you to the work of Migdalor, strengthen the connection to this incredible community Yet, however, in a time of crisis like this, I also care about doing what we can do to support you personally. We believe in providing the essentials, education, and empowerment needed for our children in Migdal Or to succeed, and likewise, feel fortunate to be able to host today's webinar in alignment with these very values. Your health and well being matter to us, and we really just want to be a resource to get through this time together. I'm honored to host social worker and manager of the Resilience Center Clinic in Seirot, in Southern Israel, under the auspices of the Israel Trauma Coalition, Esther Marcus. She's it's an art Stop Negev, not Seirot. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Stop Negev. <laughs> an art and video therapist who served as a mental health officer in the IDF. She's worked in the field of trauma and resilience for over 20 years. Esther's the author of a children's book called Color Red, which helps children cope with rocket attacks in the south of Israel. She lives in Kibbutz Alumim, a mile from the Gaza border, and has helped thousands cope with resilience in trying times. Elizabeth Kay, an art, child, and garden therapist, with a master's in art therapy, runs a child therapy center called Hachama Mashal Elizabeth in, in central Israel, and has experience working with children and teens at risk from Modi'in and the surrounding areas. She's currently training in CBT trauma-focused therapy at Metiv, the Israel Psychotrauma Center in Jerusalem, and we are just so thrilled to learn from their expertise and knowledge. Welcome, everybody, and thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much, Atara. It is uh, really an honor for us uh, to be here today. Uh, Rabbi Grossman's work uh, is known to all of us here in Israel, and um, it is really close to our hearts, especially his work with uh, children and uh, youth at risk. And uh, especially in these times, um, his mission is, uh, is uh, so important. So um, as uh, Tara said, my name is uh, Elizabeth Kay, and I am an art therapist and a garden therapist. Um, I deal, uh, I work with uh, children and teens uh, with uh, their challenges, helping them face their challenges of their everyday life. Um, much of that which is anxiety um, and dealing with uh, difficult situations, which really uh, connects very much with uh, how we're all, uh, or many of us are, are feeling today. Um, and I run a center uh, for children and teens uh, called Hachama Mashal Elizabeth, Elizabeth's Greenhouse. 
um, and it's uh, located uh, in Shilat near Mamadiyin. So thank you so much for having me. Hi, and a slightly different accent. My name is uh, Esther, as you uh, heard. Uh, very nice to meet you. Uh, also, thank you. It's a real privilege to be able to speak to you. So I'm from London originally and uh, have been living in Israel for quite a few years. So forgive me if every now and then I uh, lose a word in English. Um, and uh, I live in Kibbutz Alumim, as Atara mentioned, and can literally see Gaza from my back window. Uh, I had actually made plans that if this would have been in the light of day, I would have had Gaza in the background, but, uh, but it's nighttime and you won't see anything. Uh, and I am in charge of the clinic in our local resilience center. The area where I live uh, is mostly made up of Moshavim and Kibbutzim. And resilience centers, as you may, some of you may know, were set up a few years ago uh, in the north of the country. The concept being that when the rockets were coming over in the north, uh, the hospitals were basically um, overrun with people coming in, stressing out with the anxiety. And uh, the psychologists at the time came forward and said, it's, it's just not right that, um, that people should think that they're ill, that they have to go to hospitals. So they set up resilience centers, uh, which I'm lucky enough to be a part of. And of course, here in our area, as uh, you know, for 20 years, we've been um, uh, experiencing rocket attacks, um, balloons with fires, tunnels, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so the clinic where I work, uh, we're set up to help families and children cope with the stress and with the anxiety. And we'll talk about that today and hopefully, and as Atara mentioned, we're just here to pass over the knowledge that we have and, uh, and share with you some of the tools that we've been given. Um, but it'll be like a basic introduction to the topic. Okay. So we'll uh, start with where we're at the corona pandemic threat. Uh, and here I want to share what happened with us 20 years ago when those rockets started coming across. And in the beginning, there was one, there was another one, a little bit later another, then it was quiet, then again. And we had to go through our own adjustment period. And the word that kept being used then, and we still use today, by the way, is the word surreal. And the people that I've been speaking to over the last few weeks regarding the corona pandemic use exactly the same expression. It's just so weird, it's, it's surreal. Who would have thought uh, two months ago that this is the situation that we would have been in? We go along our lives on our little path and then something comes along and, sh and throws us a curveball, and it's really surreal and we really have to get our, our head around it. And I'd like to relate here back to, um, oh, to, to, to show what we're going to be talking about today is the whole concept of resilience. And resilience is like when you have an elastic band and our being is stretched and then shakes back again. And what happens when we go back to the point that we began, that's, that's where our resilience lies. And what we'll discuss today is a little bit of how that resilience is affected. And I'd like to start with um, Aaron Antonovsky, who you may have heard of, he's an American Israeli sociologist, who he brought us a theory uh, regarding, our, uh, regarding the, everything to do with health, saying that there are diseases all the time, all over the world. And we don't have the ability to affect what happens with those diseases, but we have to and can learn to take care of ourselves. So he brought us three three uh, things that we have to look at when we're working on this model. The first is co being com life has to be comprehensible for us. We have to understand what's going on. The second is it has to be manageable. And the third, it has to be meaningful. And through our talk this evening, we'll go through those three stages. So if we move on to the next slide, and let's first start discussing comprehensible. Uh, I don't know how long it took you to understand what the coronavirus was all about. It took me uh, a good couple of days. Uh, and even now, I'm not sure I completely 100% grasp what it's all about, uh, where it came from, where it started. But it's really important for us to ask those questions and to figure out what's going on. And when I say that about ourselves, I'm also relating to children. Children need to know what's going on. 
very often here with the, again, with the security attacks and everything that we went through, people used to say, oh, I don't like to talk to my children about the rockets. And it's quite the opposite. It's happening. It's out there. It's real. We do need to discuss things and we need to clarify. And children have the ability to understand what's going on. So we need to see where, where in life it's affecting us. So as you can see that we, what we put up on the slide, a few of the things that we thought about, it's possible that you think of other things. Uh, first and foremost, our, our health. Uh, and of course, um, along came the Ministry of Health in all our different countries. I think there was like a time gap when each one chose to, um, to tell us what to do and, and how to go about um, pr protecting ourselves. It's like here with the rockets as well, we had to learn how to protect ourselves. So here with health, we've had to learn about wearing masks, washing hands um, and keeping ourselves OK. Although we can see that um, the corona is managing to uh, get in sideways all over the place. But we have to take we have to know that what's being threatened is our health and also our general well-being, our, our mental health as well. Of course, our financial stability, how many people have lost their jobs, um, people who don't know if they're going to have a job to go back to. I don't remember the last time I saw a hairdresser. I don't know if my hairdresser will be back at work <laughs> after all of this. Um, and then, of course, our family, everything to do with our family unit. We're now seeing families uh, where people uh, like myself in their 50s who aren't able to go and visit their elderly parents or I think somewhere along the line, almost all Jewish families have a single aunt or a single uncle and we can't help them right now. Uh, and we also have to see how it affects ourselves in our home with our children. Uh, boundaries have all changed over. It used to be a case of don't mix business with pleasure. Now I'm working in my lounge, in my house, with my children on top of me while they're doing their schoolwork. All these things have been affected. Of course, our communities as well, be it uh, for myself living on a kibbutz or Liz living in Modi Inn or be it your shul community or just your neighborhood everything's changed today i was i went out to work and i was coming back and it normally it's very um it's obvious that you'd give a lift to somebody there was no way i was letting anyone in my car today <laughs> i was not a good neighbor uh we, this also affects our like system our value systems of how all the mitzvot that we're taught to do and that we want to go and visit people who are ill absolutely no way we are no longer able to do the things that are natural to us of course, education has been affected, where the children will have their exams at the end of the years. Uh, and as I said, teachers are doing their thing through the computer. Uh, first and foremost, our freedom of movement. Again, I don't know 100% what it's like there in New Jersey, uh, how far you're able to move. Here, we've been given um, a, a very much a limit of how far we can go. Somebody like myself, because my job is considered very important, uh, I do go out to work because I have clients that we have to see that they're being taken care of but most people are definitely at home certainly people over the age of 60 uh, and our social life has um, changed uh, not being able to see each other uh, so all these we have to understand and comprehend first and foremost how the coronavirus is affecting us and now I think I go over to you Liz for the next mm -hmm. the next slide thank you so um Really, in order to understand, um, in order, basically in order to find coping methods, uh, we'd like to start with understanding what our situation is, because we feel that, um, Esther and I spoke about it quite a bit, about understanding where we're at in order to be able to find um, the way that we can cope uh, with the situation. So if we, um, if we look at the normal responses to, to threat, Okay, uh, most of us recognize the fight, flight, and freeze. Okay, it's uh, really something we know from the animal kingdom. You know, mm -hmm. when there's, uh, if you think of fight, you think of usually of a, be a bear. Flight, you might think of a deer or, or a freeze, a deer in the headlights. Really, the three instinctive responses that we have when we are threatened. And they're very close. They're, they're very uh, primitive, instinctive. Um, and just like we see that in animals, we, we see those in, in ourselves. And, um, and people will react with either one of these responses or some of them or, or all of them. Um, you could start fighting, then you might 
then you might flee. Um, in another case, you might freeze. Um, sometimes we fall into a habit of doing one of the three. But, but really, the time that we're in now is, um, is really what, what I would call a survival mode. It's, um, it's a time that we've recognized that we have a threat. Um, it's a very different threat than the usual threats that we might have seen where Esther was talking about rockets, where we can understand that this is the threat and this is what we have to do. With corona, it's, it's um, a threat that's a little harder to understand. And especially in the beginning, we weren't quite sure how you deal with this threat. It's something that we don't see, we don't really quite um, understand fully um, where it's coming from, who is carrying it, somebody who might be asymptomatic might be carrying it. And so this fight, flight, and freeze uh, might be a bit confused at the moment. And yet on the other hand, if we look into these three, three Fs, we can see that there might be some, um, some of the emotions involved in these three instinctive responses that are coming out right now. For example, fight, if maybe um, in, in a primitive situation, it could have been actually fighting with your fists. Here, it might be losing our tempers or defensiveness or uh, feeling irritable. Uh, whereas we don't really quite know what got us so angry um, about the dishes being left in the sink, about Pesach cleaning not being done, or th simple things that don't really seem so important right now. It could be just part of the fact that, that there's nothing, there's no one to fight against at the moment. We have a threat, but we don't have what we can fight about, and so what we can fight against. And so it's coming out in other ways. Um, in flight, it might be um, just a feeling of anxiety and fear or finding that we're avoiding discussing the situation, um, avoiding uh, speaking to our children openly about, um, about things, and of course, in a way that they can understand. And freeze could be uh, a numbing or detachment uh, feeling uh, for some of us who find ourselves sitting on the couch in the middle of the day, scrolling through Facebook, through social media, not really you know, understanding what we're doing. It's not giving us support. It's not uh, helping us, but it is sort of a numbing situation that kind of blocks out everything around us. And these are um, natural responses. Okay? These are normal responses and natural responses for in an abnormal situation um, in which uh, we are in now. If we could just take a look at the, um, at the uh, second slide. Uh, there's also uh, something interesting um, uh, actually, before we even move to the next slide, Atara, that um, I've noticed in some of the memes that um, one of them was uh, saying how uh, the only thing we have to do now is stay at home and watch Netflix. And, and in the beginning, it was funny, but afterwards, little by little, I think uh, many of us started to realize that that is not the situation. It is very difficult to be at home. It is very difficult to lose um, our freedom, to, to, to be in the situation in which there isn't as much we can do. And uh, today, Esther and I will talk about um, really trying to move from that feeling of helplessness to finding our strengths and finding a way um, in which to do and, and, uh, and make some change. Um, let's take a look at the next uh, slide, Atara. So in this slide, we can see that besides the flight fight and freeze, we also have another F, which here is flourish. Sometimes we can see it as a uh, face. And uh, usually in the, um, when we're in survival mode, we can actually turn for help. We can connect with others. We can find a way of uh, working together to, to make a change. And here we're actually asked to do the opposite. And that is one of the difficulties in the situation. Instead of being told connect with people, find the people that can help you um, join together, we're, we're told to isolate. You're told to remove ourselves to our homes and that is the way we'll be safe. Um, especially in, 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 within Jewish religion, it's very difficult. Um, Pesach is a time where we all come together, we find ways of inviting people, of uh, finding the person that doesn't have a family and bringing them over and having a big family seders. And, uh, and now we're told, no, no, we, we, we have to stay in small family units. We have to keep ourselves isolated, which really is very um, difficult when we're going through survival mode because survival mode is 
when we actually look for connections and look for people uh, to help us. So really, what, what can we do? And uh, I think one of the important things is looking inwards and trying to find our inner strengths. What is going to help us? Um, when children uh, come to me in therapy, many times parents will say, how, how should I tell my child that they're coming to you because they need help? How can I phrase it to them? And I tell them what I say to the children is that you're coming here to find your inner strengths. And we're going on a search together to find those strengths and see how you can face those challenges that you have. And so we're facing quite a few challenges now. And the, the idea is to find our inner strengths. Um, when I was working uh, with uh, Youth at Risk in uh, Ben Shemin Youth Village, um, many times I, I would you know, say to the psychologist who was in charge, how I just wanna take these kids home. I want to give them a, a better place. And little by little, I realized that that is not what they need. They need, of course, to be cared for. And that is the wonderful um, work of Migdal Or, in which they care for, for many of the, these teens and children that don't have the homes they need. One of the things that when we work with, uh, with, with these children is that we realize that we have to tap into their resources. We have to show them the strength that they have to cope with the difficulties that they face because their families are their families and they will have to deal with them. But if they can recognize and find their inner strengths, then they will be able um, to cope. And that is um, really where resilience uh, comes in. And what is resilience? Resilience is the quality of recovering from failure and adversity, and not only returning to the status quo, but actually using the opportunity to grow and further your personal development. And basically the idea is that even though we go through something very, very difficult, if we find that strength and we manage to recover, we can actually not only return to where we were, but actually grow even more. And that's where I uh, turn to you, Esther. To, uh, slide. <laughs> okay, thank you, Liz. I, I actually want to go just one step back, something that I don't think we completely made clear. Uh, it's it really important to know you, you use the terminology which we use all the time here with families and children, that we all have normal responses to a situation that isn't normal. And it's important to know that not everybody experiences the uh, rocket attacks and not everyone is experiencing the corona as a trauma. And we have to really define that. It's, it's a difficult situation and we have to adjust. Um, but sometimes we throw out words or people throw out words and, and that in themselves can be a little bit traumatic. So it's not necessarily a personal trauma. Uh, and it's really important to know that, um, as you mentioned, and we'll see that through uh, resilience, we're all built up differently. We all have different uh, abilities to cope. We're coping, we've been coping our whole lives. Um, right. Even children coping from learning uh, from crawling to walking, uh, from going to kindergarten to next school, we're always coping, we're always um, showing that we have certain strengths and certain skills. And, and as you mentioned, uh, our job and what we're fortunate to do is to help people locate everything. It's like, you know, we're all computers and you have to be able to access what's around. So let's understand a little bit more about the science of resilience. Forgive us that we selected a film which actually um, puts definition on children, but we felt that it um, helped really understand what's going on. So let's watch this film for a minute. Resilience is the result of a highly interactive process between individual characteristics in the person and the environment in which that individual has developed. It's really the counterbalancing of difficult things that may exist in the child's life with positive things that occur within the family, but even positive things that may exist in the community. An easy way of thinking about resilience is like a, a scale um, with a fulcrum in the, in the middle of it. And there are things on both sides of that scale, experiences of both bad things or good things. Our genes shape where the fulcrum is positioned at the start. 
There are certain genes that make a child more sensitive to the effects of maltreatment or parental neglect or witnessing violence. The fulcrum may start out kind of more towards one side or more towards the other side, and that's going to make a big difference in terms of how much these subsequent events affect things positively or negatively. Science tells us that experience moves the fulcrum, for better or for worse. Even though we are born with genes, genes will respond differently to certain environmental situations as opposed to others. What the genes are actually doing are turning up or turning down the expression of chemicals in circuits in the brain and the circuitry in the entire body that, that govern our responses to stress, to anxiety, to depressive symptoms. When positive experiences accumulate and children learn coping skills that help them to manage stress, the fulcrum can slide so the scale tilts toward positive outcomes more easily. That's what resilience is all about. There's always an adult, or more than one adult, who is key to providing that relationship that helps to build resilience. Okay, so here we're getting a bit more of an understanding as to what's going on. and. What is absolutely phenomenal is how resilient both children and adults can be. Um, following on from Pesach, we'll be going on to uh, Yom HaShoah. And I think all of us know at least five to 10 stories, incredible stories about how people survived, how people coped. Um, I don't know possibly if you've seen the clip that's going around with Sharansky, who was imprisoned for years and years and how he maintained his resilience and he held that balance. Uh, and yes, a lot of it is who we are as people, as it says, our genetic makeup, um, but the surroundings, what goes on around us can really affect us, which again comes back to, as Liz mentioned, with the work that Migdal Orr is doing, it's really providing those positive outcomes and just even listening to people and just telling them that you believe in them is already really empowering their resilience. If somebody else believes in me, then maybe, yes, I can believe in myself as well. And through our sessions in the clinic, um, uh, and not just in the clinic, we go out to the communities and families, and a little bit later on, I'll show you some of the tools that we use. Um, we, we talk in terms of learning and, uh, and not necessarily as uh, just therapy. It's really learning how to maintain that status quo. We have demands in our life and we also have our own resources. So our demands have definitely changed over the last few weeks. Uh, it used to be get up in the morning, get out the house, get the kids out the house, get to school, get to work, um, do my shopping. Uh, I would say cooking, but I live on a kibbutz, so that doesn't apply to me. But it's <laughs> you. Uh, all kinds of other things, the gardening, getting ready for Pesach. So these are things that we have to do. But on the other hand, these are, this is what we have. Yeah, I, I have a job, I have a car, I have my resources, I have my sense of humor, I have my social life. So if we manage to keep this balance, we're okay. As soon as the demands get heavier for us and we're lacking in resources, that's when the problems set in. Those are the people that we have to step in and take more care of their well-being. Those are the people even now you could be looking out for in your family, in your community, where what, what they feel is demanded of them is just too heavy. And maybe we need to lighten their load. We need to help them reassess what they can and can't do. But everybody who comes into therapy, or everybody who we have just a talk with them, uh, it, we help them understand that the way that they behave is perfectly normal. If I go back to the fight, flight, freeze. Some people think that those are negative um, um, new defense mechanisms that we have. No, quite the opposite. They're really positive. If you are faced in a, in a, to, with danger, yeah, run away, hello, that's the right thing to do. It's okay. When a rocket's coming over, 
We don't want to stand outside. We want to go to a safe place. When those rockets start coming in, some people move away. They go and stay with other people. That's absolutely fine. And even when people say, but I froze, but nobody ever 100% freezes because our body continues functioning. We're still breathing. We're still sweating. We're still, our nervous system is still working. Quite the opposite. The body is working in order to send us those signs of danger. What happens when we're under threat is that our brain can't always process. It, it just can't process quickly enough what's going on but the body steps in and holds and helps out. So it's good that we have those mechanisms. What is important though, is that we become aware of what's going on, who we are and what we have to deal with. And this is the point I move back over to Liz and I realize how much I'm using my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Esther. So, um, so really uh, one of the uh, main things that we're finding is that uh, understanding what you're going through can help you through uh, because many a times we might feel anxious we might wake up feeling something um, some discomfort um, a pain in our chest a pain in our stomach we don't really quite know what is bothering us uh, you know we're fine nobody nobody's been taken to hospital uh, we're managing okay everything is okay and yet we don't we feel so anxious and so um, one of the uh, one of the uh, topics that um, that we've been talking about recently is basically accepting and adjusting to this new reality. That what's happened here is uh, is basically the the Earth has has uh, has moved. You know, we we took certain things for granted. This is how we live our lives. We go out in the morning. We go to our jobs. We see people. We go out for, to concerts, to co to coffee shops. Uh, uh, we prepare for our holidays, and all of a sudden, everything has changed within just a few weeks. Um, something that was far away in China is all of a sudden in our communities, and, um, and that is a totally new reality. And just going back to, um, to Esther saying about the rockets, it's, it's, um, that's the word that's coming up all the time. It's, it's surreal. It doesn't seem that this could possibly be happening all over the world. How can we walk outside and there's nobody around? And, um, and that, this time period of accepting and adjusting to a new reality is very difficult. Um, if we look at number one, grief and loss, um, one of the, uh, the emotions that are coming up now is grief. Um, you know, loss is not only the loss, uh, God forbid, of a loved one. Loss is also um, our loss of uh, our feeling of security. We've lost something. I think uh, many of you, um, if you, you, you might, might take you uh, back to 9-11 um, with that feeling of you know, safety that was just somehow lost in, in just a few moments. Um, if I take it you know, in, uh, in Israel, so I think of um, uh, over 20 years ago when we had uh, two helicopters that crashed um, and it was a, a terrible tragedy and uh, and that was where just one of these things that shattered everybody's um, feeling of security. Um, another, another part of our grief or our feeling of loss is our loss of freedom, our loss of freedom. All of a sudden we can't go where we want to go. Um, and we are free people. We, you know, those of you living in America, those of you living in Israel, we're free people. We go where we want, we do what we want, um, and all of a sudden we can't. And it's not because somebody's standing there, it's because we, we know that there's a, a threat. Um, jobs, some of us don't have jobs. I, I found that for myself, um, as a child therapist, even a, a few days before um, the new rules were made, I, I decided that I had to stop seeing the children because I felt that my clinic being a place where children are touching all the art supplies and working in the garden and working very close to me, I felt that it wasn't safe um, for them to, to be there, for, for us to be together. Um, and that was very, very hard to come home and not be working at a time where there were children that needed me and where I felt uh, fulfilled in my job. And many of you might be sitting and saying, I can't do my job now. It can't work online. Um, and that's a loss. Uh, some of you are, are working online and it's not the same as your usual day-to-day -day meeting with other people. 
And that's also a loss, and that's something we're processing now. And of course, health, um, the, uh, the security of knowing that we're healthy or that our loved ones are, are healthy, yet all of a sudden this, um, this virus is, is attacking our health. So, so there is that, that grief and loss that um, many of us may be feeling. Um, there's also dealing with collective grief because uh, many a times when we're feeling sad or feeling upset about something, there is somebody that we can call that's not dealing with that at the moment. And at the moment, everyone is dealing with this. So it's, it's something that is um, affecting people all over the world. Um, but unlike the usual collective grief, where everybody comes together and joins together, this is a time that we're all very isolated. So the beauty of people holding hands, of coming together for prayer, of, uh, of meeting and lighting candles, all of a sudden that's taken away even though we have that uh, collective grief. Another thing I wanted to relate to is something that Esther brought up, is, um, is the fact that this, this type of situation um, can trigger uh, memories of other losses. So whereas someone who, uh, this is the first time dealing with, such a, with a situation, would, might deal with this and only this, Someone who might have uh, had a loss of a loved one or um, a personal loss of, of other, in other uh, aspects of their life might find that this is being triggered by the current crisis. And so where you might be saying, well, why is my next door neighbor doing so great and everyone's so happy in their home and I am feeling so miserable, you can look back and say, okay, is this, is this triggering something that's happened in my life before? And maybe I'm feeling sad that my relative died a few years ago, and this is reminding me of this time that he was in the hospital. And to recognize that and accept that and say, you know what, that's okay. I'm grieving. This is hard for me. I am feeling sad. And I will find my strengths to cope with it, but that's okay. Another thing that, um, that I'm also finding is when we deal with, uh, you know, having self-compassion and relating to the fact that it's, um, it, that we accept that we have um, these feelings of loss, is also being able to accept when people come to us for help and, um, and just be with them. There's a lot of being in these times rather than doing. Um, there's not as much of that we can do there is, and Esther and I will both speak about that as well, but the being. So the, for example, if somebody comes to you, if a parent or a child or a friend comes to you and says, you know, I'm feeling anxious, I, I, I'm just feeling so afraid, our immediate reaction might be, well, don't worry, you're at home, you're isolated, nothing's going to happen to you. Um, that might not be the right answer. It might just be, yeah, I understand you. That's hard. It really is a difficult situation. How are you managing? Um, and what are you doing? And how do you think you can help yourself? And giving them that belief that I'm, I'm sure you'll find a way because I can imagine those feelings are very difficult for you. Um, another thing that's uh, really uh, an adjust adjustment for us at the moment is the number two, changes in our distinctions of home and work. Um, whereas before we could bring our work home if we had to or if we decided to, now our work is just coming straight into the home. And uh, whether it means that we're on an apartment in a Zoom call and somebody walks by in their pajamas or a big blanket walks by the back of our screen and, um, and everyone can see what's in our houses when our homes were private places, all of a sudden that's changing. I'm uh, speaking to therapists that are saying that they have no end to their day, that their day is starting in the morning and it just goes through to the nighttime. Whereas there were much clearer distinctions beforehand of when they left, uh, they left their, their clinic, when they left their office. So that is something that we have to see where we create our boundaries between home and work. These are all adjusting to new realities and the changes in our routine, our exercise, our activities, how can we fit those in? Because those are very, very important things that we've lost at the moment. When, we've, uh, when we don't have our exercise classes, we aren't able to take our walks outside. Uh, we don't have the activities that let us relax. How are we going to find those, um, those important, important things in our lives? How are we gonna make 
uh, room for them in this, uh, in this new reality. Um, if we could just head over to the next slide. Um, one of the important things is um, connecting um, to your emotions and those of your loved ones. And uh, one of the things that, um, that I basically I've said that before is how, how do we connect? By recognizing them, by recognizing how we're feeling and accepting those feelings and accepting those of our loved ones. And as I said before, acknowledging them. Um, the, um, in, uh, in one of the things actually I'm just realizing, sorry, that I, I didn't say before, is when we are dealing with these changes, um, one of the things that I tend to do is look to nature. Because when I work uh, in the garden with my clients, so many times we'll go out and plant something. And when we're planting those things, um, we've planted a beautiful flower or a beautiful vegetable. And when we come back the next week, there might be other things that have happened to that. So it could be that it, it grew or it could be that some animal came in the middle of the night and took out a big bite out of it or that weeds grew around it and there's change. And as the client can accept that change, they can begin to grow because when we are able to accept that change, we can start seeing that things can be done differently and that can also be okay. Um, I actually noticed in, uh, it's, it's something that we see in the, in the makat barad, in the hail, um, in the Egyptian plagues, whereas the hail affected those, uh, it affected the wheat, it knocked down the wheat that was standing up strong and brown. But the other, the other, um, the other uh, uh, plants that were still green and not yet ripened were able to change and adjust and were actually able to survive. So changing and adjusting is a very, very important thing in, in, uh, in this period in, uh, in, in what's going on today. And another thing is checking in with your body. Your body keeps the score. And that is something that I experienced just uh, a few days ago when, um, when someone called me up and told me, you know, I've woken up just crying, just feeling terrible, feeling anxious, and I'm really not sure. And I don't know what it is. I'm managing very well. I'm, I'm, I have what I need. I'm doing my job. I'm managing very well. Um, on the other hand, I know she's also taking care of her parents uh, that are older and, and uh, are not supposed to leave the home at the moment. And when I had her sit down, you know, we spoke on the phone, I had her sit down, connect, let her feet touch the floor, connect to the chair she's sitting in, let her back feel the back of the chair. And I said, look inside a little bit and feel where your body is. What, what, what feels good in your body? And when she just stopped for a minute and took a few breaths and said, you know what? The only place in my body at the moment that feels good is my legs. My legs are feeling good. I said, okay, connect with that feeling in your legs. And she said, you know why my legs are feeling good? Because that's the only place that I know I can walk and I can do something and that I won't be harming anyone by infecting them, by bringing the virus to them. And we realized that her fear was that her doing for her parents would cause them harm. And through that, through her connecting with her body, she was able to find a way of saying, okay, I will take care, I will stay away from, from my parents, but bring them the things they need. And this way she could find a way to accept, acknowledge her emotions and be able to, um, to do something with them that could be helpful. Okay, on to you, Esther. <laughs> okay, as I, I, I realized in, the, in this slide, we didn't mention the famous Jewish guilt that we all carry as well. Um, that's <laughs> a biggie for us emotionally, especially now around uh, Pesach, what's important for us to know is, um, is, is to really try and not get stuck in those places where guilt or anxiety or depression take over us. Those are the cases where really um, professional people need to be uh, to step in. But, uh, but let's go back to day to day. Let's go back to all of us and, and let's see. Well, OK, so, yeah, that's the situation and the situation is bad. And this is what we're going through, but what can we do in order to cope? And we have to recognize here a fundamental factor that you, me, Atara, Migdal Or, which is an amazing organization, and 
none of us have got any control at the moment on that coronavirus. The same as I don't have any control here over what goes on in Gaza, the politicians are involved and the army and, and whoever and whatever. But I have to work out what I do have control over and I do have control over what happens in my house or in my garden right now. And that's where we look now to see our resources. And exactly as Liz says, we have to learn to turn things around and take away that feeling of helplessness, not necessarily see ourselves as victims, but see ourselves as survivors and people who can cope and can get on with it and, and also help each other find what works for them, what works for me. So let's look at the model that um, Dr. Muli Lahad established. Uh, he is a phenomenal, um, I actually can't remember now if he's a psychologist or a social worker. I've got a feeling he's a social worker, but I can't 100% remember, so forgive me. Um, I was fortunate enough to study with him when I served in the army um, as a mental health officer. And in those days, um, we were still using the term shell shock when people, uh, when soldiers in battle uh, went on, were through traumatic experiences. And of course, as we know, this has all changed and it's been called PTSD. And I even think that that now today is going through a change because people call what we're going through, um, it's not a one-off traumatic episode. We're going through a series of abuse. And possibly when we talk about the pandemic, that's also like we're being abused at the moment by, by the disease. Um, but we all have abilities to cope. So Dr. Molly Lahad developed a model for us called the basic PH, where each letter stands for a mashab, a resource, something that we all have. The B stands for belief. So we all have some set of values, uh, our ideology, um, something that we stand by, something that defines us. Uh, it could be our religion. Um, it could be, you could be a secular person, but still have very uh, strong beliefs and your values and your system, what you believe and see is the right way or the wrong way. Um, and so when we're coping with things that are going on around us, uh, it's an opportunity for us to dig deep and see, okay, what do I believe in? What do I want to be happening here? And possibly with the corona, what we're saying, what we're believing is, okay, it's difficult for me to uh, keep the mitzvot maybe, but there are so many things I could still be doing, even if I'm praying individually, um, remaining optimistic, remaining hopeful, that's really, really powerful. And I, I'm gonna keep doing that. And I'm gonna think of something positive to say every morning when I get up. So our belief system is a very powerful resource that we have within us. Then A stands for effect, how we're feeling. Liz described just before uh, the emotions that we're going through. It's important also to know that we can be experiencing a roller coaster of emotions. You could wake up in the morning and be full of energy and yeah, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And two hours later, you're like, uh, uh, as a, uh, and you don't even <laughs> appreciate how your energy is deflated. One thing we didn't mention, by the way, is worry. We're all carrying a certain amount of worry and that worry takes a lot of energy. Um, so it can be up and down during the day. We could go from, feeling great to feeling really sad. And the more that we're aware of our emotions and the more that we're able to express those emotions, then the more um, success we'll have at coping with everything. I, I'm not necessarily saying that everybody should go around sharing the whole time. <gasps> that sounds really cynical. I'm an English person speaking to Americans. I forgive me, forgive me. English people aren't used to expressing their emotions or sharing their emotions, uh, which I think is a problem for us. Um, so we have to find the balance, how we balance. express ourselves, even if it's just expressing them to ourselves is already a great thing. Uh, it's also really important, especially now with the corona, when you're at home with all your kids, you have to take a time out. You have to 20 minutes, half an hour, say to your spouse, listen, I I've just got to go and sit in that room, shut the door. Uh, it's, you know, the kids are just driving me crazy. We all love our children. We love them dearly. But yeah, they drive us crazy. And yeah, we have to know how to um, restrain ourselves and not go over the top. And if we feel that that's happening to ourselves, then that's the point where you say, I need my time out. We all need time out. We're human beings. A car needs to have petrol poured into it. 
we need food, we, ne we need to relax. And it's very difficult at the moment to find time to relax. And it's important to put that into your daily routine, your weekly routine. S stands for social. We're creatures, we're naturally sociable creatures. We want to speak to other people, mix with other people. Um, as we mentioned, Liz mentioned, we have, we've lost our freedom of movement, but there are other alternatives, be it WhatsApp groups, be it Facebook, there's social media. Again, not all these things are suitable for everybody. Uh, and I think we also have to um, find our balance, what works for us and what doesn't work for us. Um, maybe, you know, just speaking to somebody can take a lot of energy from you. So maybe you'll just speak to people two, three times a day. Uh, there's hundreds and thousands of messages going around, which is on the one hand, fantastic. And I think it's really bringing people together. Uh, on the other hand, it can be a little bit too much and we have to know how to protect ourselves as well. Um, but in our communities, you're a community, maybe who we're talking to, you each belong to four or five different communities uh, and you're able to come together and get ideas from each other. I live in Kibbutz Alumim, which is a religious kibbutz, and I can see that there's a WhatsApp group getting ideas from the other kibbutzim, what we can adopt that you're doing, that we're doing, what works for you, what works for us. Uh, it's really, as we mentioned before, this incredible opportunity to, to flourish, to bring people together, uh, one of the most amazing things for me during Tsuketan, um, Protective Edge, uh, was the phenomena of support and volunteers that people came. There was a group even um, from a synagogue in, uh, in Livingstone in New Jersey. And the whole, a whole busload of people came here to share the experience with us. And what was incredible was it just didn't matter if you were religious or not religious, if you were right wing, left wing, Everybody came together. The same again, as I believe Migdal Or is out there for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. That equality was amazing. So S is a real biggie, a fantastic resource. I, your imagination, you may have noticed I generally use humor a lot. Uh, I think we're all receiving some fantastic um, films and people who've written songs to uh, the Sound of Music or Phantom of the Opera or all kinds of incredible things. People are using their imagination and it's really, really important to keep developing that. Uh, there are some people who, who don't have that. They can't tune in. They can't tune into imagining because they're, they're more C, which is the next one, which is cognition, that they're more um, deductive, like thinking and getting answers and they see things like this. So for people who are more like that, it will be difficult to use imagination, but it's an opportunity to try and go there. Um, so as I mentioned, oh, AI also in, in includes all your creativity, uh, art, as Elizabeth mentioned, gardening, listening to music, all kinds of things like that. Uh, cognition, we mentioned, knowing what's going on, learning. Again, I think we have to uh, protect ourselves. Not, I'm not saying not to know too much, but I, I found myself the other day watching the news at three o'clock in the morning, um, to finding out what's going on in Scandinavia or somewhere. And I'm thinking, I, I, don't, I don't need to know. I don't need to know absolutely everything of how every single country is coping with it. Um, so, but it's important to, to be aware and to have knowledge. And the final, the pH, physical, um, is, yeah, we ha are limited in our movement, but we can still move around and our body needs it. We need to release stress. We need to release tension. Did I say now I would do the toolbox? Cause I can't remember for a second. Yes. Yes. Toolbox. Okay, here we go. So here, because of what we've been through again for the 20 years, we um, set up various workshops to encourage our children to build little toolkits that they would take themselves, take with them into the safe room. Mostly we encourage them to have them already in the safe room. So what does that include? Um, if we mentioned stress, anxiety, so in the packet, but certainly for little children, not working very well, but bubbles, which is helping with their breathing. It's very, very important work with the body to when you uh, have more control over your breathing, you lower your stress. Uh, in the same regard, 
in our toolbox, we encourage to take little sponges. Well, I'm, what, we, what we do also is to say, you've got all these things in your house, it's just a matter of finding them. It's fantastic with a sponge, squidge it up, really squeeze, that's physical, the pH, and then let go and release that stress. And even you can turn it into a game. Which hand have I got the sponge in? Okay, you got it right. Um, balls are amazing as well. Squidgy again. Um, we take a little scarf, put it on, and see if you can blow, blow the scarf off of you. Um, crayons for coloring in. We encourage them to take a little box and maybe place inside the box when things are okay, when there are no rockets, place little messages for yourself. And when you go into that safe room and you open the box and you take out little messages, um, or maybe some other games here, somebody put in lots of little balls that they can play with inside. Balls are fantastic. Um, energy, food to keep us going. That's the petrol that we need. Hamets, got to get rid of that. Somebody here developed these wonderful little hand puppets and the hand puppet, puppet, it pops open and we see a little heart inside, a little heart here. And we help when we work with children to understand their emotions, to connect up with what they're feeling here, what they're feeling in their mind, what they're feeling in their body. It's really important also to take a holistic approach. The mind and body all comes together. Um, what else do I have for you? In our toolbox, we may have to heal him. We may have, do you remember this? We called it cat's cradle. Did you call it that in America? Little, a little shoelace and you've got five games, six games. Um, and everything comes together in a little bag and it's all there. And these are the kind of things you could even be making now with your family. Uh, it helps you to release the stress. You're using your imagination. You're playing games. I forgot also we have a pack of cards. We have a little notepad. Write down what's going on. Keeping a diary is fantastic for families, for children, for communities, because when you get together afterwards, and this goes back to belief, hope, we're going to get through this. It's really important to know that it is not forever. We had years without Corona. We're going to have years again without corona or with corona but under control what's going to happen then we have to look to the future really important i feel like i'm jabbering away sorry back to you liz thank you so we're really uh, coming to uh to the end of our of our hour and um really what uh one of the most important things and first of all thank you esther because that toolbox is uh i think very important because what we're really speaking about is finding the tools that we have to, um, to cope. So the tools that we have to find meaning, to find meaning in what we're going through. Rabbi Sachs um, put out a beautiful, um, uh, a beautiful drasha, a uh, beautiful talk uh, this past week, in which he discussed that, you know, Passover, he finds it funny that people say, Chag Sameach, happy Passover. Because Passover really is a, um, a very special holiday in which we really deal with, with the bread of affliction, with difficulty, with pain, with finding ourselves in a very harsh place and finding meaning and coming to a place of redemption. And I think whereas uh, our seders might be very different this year, yet on the other hand, it is really a time for us to discuss um, with ourselves, or with the people that are with us, um, some of you are, who will be with your children, um, finding meaning, finding meaning in your lives, finding meaning in your stories. Um, Esther and I both have, uh, have many stories we could tell you of, uh, of people uh, searching for meaning when uh, they were going through difficult times. And these are really the times that we can search for those meanings in the history of our, of our people, um, in our own history, stories that we can tell and how we came through. And um, I really believe that, um, that this holiday is an opportunity for us to, um, to take a Seder and really uh, find that meaning that could uh, help us cope um, in these difficult times and help us look towards uh, a better future. 
uh, Esther? I absolutely agree. Uh, to me, and thanks to you because of asking us to give this talk, uh, Sadonite is based on the basic pH, the theory that I just mentioned. We have B, we have our beliefs, uh, because we believe uh, we're, you know, this is our, our, our ritual. Again, whether you're religious or not religious, I, so many people I know who aren't religious will still have Sadonite. It's fantastic. We have the basis that's there. Uh, effect, we have how we are emotionally. Um, we're told to imagine what it was like to come out of Egypt, what that really felt like. We're told to imagine it's there, the same as the theory. We are trying to relive something they went through. Wow, what were they going through? Oh, what am I going through? Um, what else do we have? We have um, fantastic food, hopefully, we'll see. Um, <laughs> but that's putting into the, the pH, our bodies, that we need that food. Uh, and I know, well, pH, I also think, is what we're going through now, hopefully going through now, is cleaning our house, deciding what to keep, deciding what not to keep. Uh, that's part, I think, of also our own sort of meditation um, that we're going through, that we can make those decisions even during the day. What am I going to deal with? What am I not going to deal with? What thoughts do I want to keep in my head? What thoughts do I want to leave outside? Uh, we're like cleansing ourselves spiritually as well as cleaning our houses. Um, and so, and Lela said it first and foremost is a narrative. It's a story. We're telling a story see lots of questions the rabbis are discussing so cognition is in there as well uh, it's all there and as we said before we've got fight flight freeze but now we can also have flourish we can have flourish on an individual level and even though our families are split up maybe we can really work hard to give everybody the sense of not being alone maybe when you're making packages now that you're giving out to your community you can add in some of the things that I mentioned um, or even if it's just a card to say thinking of you we're going to get through this those words can have so much meaning um, which again we come back to what we talked about in the beginning of our Nadotsky that we have it's comprehensible we understand what we're going through it's manageable yes we can cope I, I, people ask me how you, I stay working for so many years I'm sure Liz also because um, there are a lot of people who work in therapy and they reach burnout I'm so amazed by the human being that people's capacity and ability to deal with really terrible, awful things. And it's just phenomenal and it's exciting. It's so exciting to be able to be involved with helping other people get through things. And, and that's not even necessarily just in therapy, just as people, we are incredible and we can get through this and we will get through this. And there also, Leila said, every year we say, not that I think we necessarily mean it, that we're going to be in Yerushalayim, but it's the concept of hope. It's the concept of putting things in perspective. We are going to get there. We're going to get to a better place. We're going to be a better person, hopefully, better people. Um, and, and I hope that we've been able to give you some of that passion that we feel working with people and being able to, to get through something. Uh, one teeny last thing, a few people... Have, people have come to visit us on the kibbutz and they, and they say to me, oh, you're, you're like heroes. And we're not. We are so not heroes. We're just living. We're just doing what anybody else would do in our situation. And now under the corona, we're all heroes because we're all surviving, coping, trying to make the best of something that is not so amazing. And we have to figure out how to turn it around. And I wanted to just share with you on that note, turning things around. This is a Kassam rocket which landed in our kibbutz and I managed to take it and paint it and it's going in the garden and some plants which Liz is going to help me with are going <laughs> to climb up this Kassam rocket and we're going to turn it around from something negative into something positive and beautiful and let's hope that we can do the same now that we can really learn and get through this hard time. And here we go, Liz, you'll do the final slide. Yeah, well, well they're really that, that beautiful, uh, taking a rocket of uh, destruction and bringing, uh, bringing us uh, something beautiful to it, uh, really leads us to this, uh, this quote by Viktor Frankl, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. 
Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. So with these words, um, we are wishing you a meaningful Passover, a Passover in which you can find um, relief and hope and your inner strengths and meaning. Um, to us from Israel, Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Esther, for that incredible presentation. I can say that for me specifically, you raised the things that are so essential in our being and we manage to often forget when we're dealing with a crisis situation and something we're not used to, or like you said, normal responses to abnormal situations. You've educated us and personally, you've, you've empowered us as well. I think that going into this holiday where we talk about freedom and redemption, to tap into those three core values of Migzal Or, which also guide each and every one of us on a day-to-day -day basis, you've reminded us what we have as our strengths and enabled us to see the tools that exist from within, really not so far out because we are isolated, we are all in our own spaces, and to be able to tap into that and see this as a time of strength for all of us. I wanted to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon, this evening, earlier in the morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you all. We are also adding tomorrow night, if you'd like to join us as well at eight o'clock. We have another webinar called Home for the Holiday, which is a cooking demo with Chef Elizabeth Kurtz. So you can come and enjoy us, enjoy that as well. You had some food for the soul. You could have food for your tummies. We really just want to thank you all, wishing you a Chag Pesach Kasher Sameach. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Shana Bab Yushalayim. That's right. <laughs>